Good evening. Welcome to the Kansas Legislature on Smoky Hill Public Television. My name is Mike Walker. I'm with the Docking Institute of Public Affairs at Fort A. State University. Welcome to the show. I have two uh, guests with me tonight. We have Ken Rogers from the 110th District. Uh, it's from Agra, Agra on my right. And we also have Troy uh, Waymaster from the 109th District right here in Bunker Hill. Uh, before we get our, uh, traditionally, I like to go around and talk a little bit about where you're from and whatnot, but let's jump to a few questions and we can get back to that sure, if you don't mind. Mm -hmm. I want to remind folks that this is a call-in program, so please call in. The number is 1-800-337-4788. In fact, it's my birthday today, so do me a favor and call in. Oh, happy <laughs> <birthday>. <laughs> no, I don't <laughs> You want to sing for you? I was always saying that would <laughs> encourage calls, so that's what we're going to do. Mm. Let's uh, jump into a couple things. I know this is, of course, we spend our time talking about the Kansas legislature and Kansas politics and policy. But today we did find out, I believe I'm correct, that the uh, federal partial shutdown mm -hmm. has sh uh, ended. Any comments on the shutdown? And will be ending. We're glad that it's over or it will be ending. Yeah, the, the House is, I think they went into debate at oh. 6.30 Eastern time. Okay. I don't know if I didn't hear if anything, if the debate was over. but. Sounds like tonight the federal shutdown uh, will end, um, which actually had an impact. Actually, um, I'm the chairman of the Appropriations Committee, and Ken uh, serves on it because he's the chairman of Higher Education Budget. Right. And uh, we actually had a briefing yesterday um, from uh, some individuals from K-State University uh, basically talking about, one, the implica implications of the 2018 Farm Bill, um, how that will impact us out here in the state of Kansas. And then we did talk about uh, some of the ramifications of the uh, shutdown. One of those was like uh, the SNAP program uh, with nutrition. Uh, right. uh, only has funding up until the end of February and uh, the individual that uh, was the conferee for us and committee said that uh, they do have some reserve funds that they can move beyond February if the shutdown continues. Uh, but now that won't be an issue uh, because uh, tonight it, it should be over. Well, it's a, it's a you know, I wouldn't, you know, spike the ball either side. Well, good both point. both sides are saying they good. won. Both sides really, I think, uh, I don't think we gained anything. It's three weeks. Um, it, it's kind of been piecemealing. Uh, I know there's a lot of Republicans are upset with the, with the president right now. Um, you know, there's going to get a lot of work done in the, in the three weeks. Uh, you know, checks, paychecks couldn't go out tonight. They'll go out probably early next week. Farm service agency uh, are open. There's a lot, a lot of farmers I talked to were wanting, you know, to get their uh, market facilitation uh, program data, you know, inputted. They were mm -hmm. just waiting, and then the, then the government shut down. Right. So it has a big economic impact. So, you know, it, that obviously, I mean, some of the programs that affect our counties with the SNAP program and others, I mean, those will be taken care of, at least for the short term. But uh, we're not out of the woods no. by any means. Good but, uh, uh, you know, <clears throat> Topeka doesn't work like D.C., I'll tell you that much. We, we, <laughs> we wouldn't do this. Right. Can't, right. can't do it. Can't do it. And, and Ken is right. It's, it's unfortunate that it's only a three-week stint. Right. Um, and I'd probably, if I had to place any bets, I would probably say we'll be shut down again after three weeks. Because I don't think uh, anything is going to be determined on a border wall or the funding uh, right. between the, the president and Congress in that three-week period. They weren't able to come to it with a five-week shutdown. Well, I, there's not going to be any way that I, I, I would like to be optimistic. Uh, but I just think with the, the government shut down for over a month and they weren't able to come to any type of resolve, um, I, I don't know what three weeks is going to, to do, but hopefully we it doesn't happen. Get but I, I would probably folks, I guess yeah, the, the I would probably guess that the shutdown may happen again. Do you have anything from the well? Farmers did get hit pretty hard. We had the uh, the tariff that that hit them, and then the shutdown. You mentioned uh, information you received from folks at K State. Mm -hmm. uh, do you want to uh, describe some of the information you, that was provided? One to you? of the um, the biggest questions that people have been having because of last year. Uh, the state of Kansas passed what was Senate Bill 263, which was uh, the research program on industrial hemp. Right. And that was included in the Senate version of 
the, fe the federal farm bill and uh, stayed in and then was signed in the law. So people have been having questions about, well, now that it's not an, a, control, un, a controlled substance with the federal government, how does that impact the program that we have in the state of Kansas? And after that bill was passed and signed by Governor Collier, um, I served on the advisory committee where we went through the rules and regs for the research of industrial hemp and worked through that, we basically uh, uh, concocted an application process and okay. the KBI background checks. And there are some changes that were going to have to be made. Mm -hmm. On Tuesday afternoon, uh, Senator Dan Kirshen and I uh, presented to the Kansas Watershed Annual Meeting, basically just a, a legislative update. And uh, he kind of talked about that because the Senate really drove that last year. They were the first ones to introduce it. Um, and actually it was uh, Chairman Kirshen that uh, put a lot of the language in that bill. And so I would probably say uh, that he would probably be spearheading that. He kind of mentioned that during his talk uh, because he said there, are, there is already a, a bill drafted um, by the Department of Ag. They sent that to me before session began so I could look over it. Um, and basically, it's just going to uh, coincide with what the federal government um, okay. has passed in the Farm Bill. And I would have to say, I haven't talked to Chairman Hyland uh, on the House side, but just d given the comments that Chairman Kirshen made at that uh, annual meeting, um, I think he said that we need to get something passed, passed okay. quickly, because we want to start having the applications approved so uh, farmers and growers in the state of Kansas can uh, plant hemp right. in April. Right. Well, fantastic. We can get back to that in a bit, if you have more to add. But we have Ron from Garden City. Ron, go ahead, please. Hi. I just wanted to ask either of the gentlemen if uh, it appears the governor's budget is built upon reamortization of keeper's payments. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering if they think that proposal has better chances than a snowball on a hot plate. <laughs> No. <laughs> yeah, I would say it doesn't no. have much of a chance. Uh, you want to describe some of that for the audience that might not? Well, Governor Kelly came out with her budget after the state of the state, and uh, traditionally, at least over the last uh, eight years, we've had a biannual, a two-year budget. Mm -hmm. uh, this budget is now one year, and um, there's been a lot of conjecture now after this that no, it's not built on on that. But uh, in a sense, the idea of reamortizing capers to gain, uh, say, an additional $145 million a year mm -hmm. that you could use then to help pay for programs within the budget. But if you look at the numbers, okay. uh, by reamortizing, um, you would have an additional $7.4 billion, that's with a B, billion dollars that we would have to pay back. We have worked hard the last Very three good. to four years putting hundreds of millions of dollars to get back in. Okay. I just don't, you know, and now, now this is not a partisan situation. Two years ago, Governor Brownback wanted to do this. A very heavily Republican controlled legislator said no. Okay. The Capers board says no. We're going to have to look at something else because, as I've said in this program many times, we have made a commitment to Capers. We have done that. We are making those payments. It is one of the most solid uh, pension programs in the country, and it will continue to be. And I know at least those of us here, we will fight to make sure that that's the case and it will be. So as you look at right now with the uh, Representative Waymaster being chair of approves, I mean, that's, he, he's kind of the, you know, he's the linchpin of putting this whole budget together. And so uh, I guess that, that's my little rant you on know, papers. And then, and, uh, <laughs> you know, you can kind of, you, you brought, uh, no, that makes you know, sense. Uh, I, I brought, yeah, I brought the, uh, the governor's <laughs> budget. It's right here. Right. Um, actually, I was surprised. When, when she released her budget or the budget director released it and she had uh, basically had as a, a key part of her budget the reamortization of capers when two years ago when Governor Brownback did it she was against it. Um, so that kind of surprised me uh, that that was part of one of the components of her budget. Ken's exactly right. We have made um, large strides in trying to bring down the unfunded liability in capers and right now we're about two years from those payments going down. Ah. So if we continue making the payments into CAPERS, then our annual payment goes down. If we reamortize the unfunded liability for another 30 years, it plateaus for a long time and doesn't drop off until, was it 2036 right. or something around there? Um, okay. So the reamortization of CAPERS has not been well received, not by legislators, <laughs> uh, not by leadership. 
uh, not by the Capers board, not, not by, by Alan teachers, Conroy. Teachers, not by state employees. He says, yeah. I've been getting phone calls and, hmm. and Everybody is, is right. worried Very about concerned. re amortization because when you hear about touching anything of Capers, obviously red flags come up. Sure. And um, so actually yesterday I did have a meeting with Governor Kelly um, and to talk about the differences that we had with her mm -hmm. budget mm -hmm. and where I see things going in appropriations. And, uh, and I, I think we, we had a good meeting and we talked about our differences and how we want to move forward and some of the different components. Um, and one of those being the reamortization of capers. I see. Okay. And that is something, uh, you know, <coughs> the Speaker of the House um, asked us last week if, if I wanted to carry that in appropriations or if the, uh, the finance and pensions committee wanted uh, to carry that bill of re-amortizing re uh, capers and both of us said no. <laughs> we, do, we don't even want to uh, touch that. Right. Because it, Ken's exactly right. For a short-term gain, we have long-term issues and $7.4 billion more that will be paid over mm -hmm. the 30-year period. And so to me, it just doesn't make fiscal sense. Okay. That sounds good. Well, actually, that's one of my points I want to bring up. We do have a new governor. We have a new year, new legislative session, and a new governor that's uh, a Democrat. Uh, the House and the Senate are controlled by Republicans. So, And you guys are on some key committees. Uh, you mentioned already that the Appropriations Committee, Legislative Budget Committee, uh, Higher Education Budget Committee, and Taxation and Appropriations. So mm -hmm. you are the folks that I imagine will be dealing with the Kelly administration to kind of work out all these problems. And I so was on your the State first Finance Council as well, oh, okay. which is headed by the governor. <clears throat> right. So what's your impressions uh, besides this issue uh, of the new governor and, and being able to work with the new administration? I, I believe that, uh, speak, speaking freely here, I think the folks in Kansas want something to be done, some, some cooperation. <laughs> well, and, and like I said, I had a meeting with her yesterday, yeah. and I extended the invitation because... I, I wanted to have a discussion with her and tell her, like, I don't agree with some of the components of your budget. Sure, sure. Um, one of those, as we you know, already discussed, the capers reamortization. Uh, the other was, and even though I hated doing this a couple years ago, my first year as chair of appropriations, mm. I had to go to the well and implore the, the body to pass a bill to basically take a loan out against mm. the pooled money investment board account. Um, in her budget, she has that being paid completely off in 2019, which is about $317 million. Hmm. When we passed that bill, we had that on a payment schedule of five years. I see. And so paying it off completely, um, although I can understand it somewhat, but it, it kind of contradicts reamortizing capers when you have an interest component I to see. it, and this is a 0% interest loan that she wants to pay off in 2019. Hmm. Okay. And so one thing that I've been kind of looking at is for cash flow purposes, is okay yeah we can pay that off in an accelerated fashion mm. but let's do it maybe in two or three years let's use that that portion that won't be going back to the pooled money investment board account and use that for the kansas department of transportation projects for capers um, we also have to address k-12 through education finance again the session um, and so that money can be used um, for other Sure. Departments or agencies, as opposed to just <clears throat> since we have a nine hundred and ten million dollar ending balance approximately, instead of drawing that all the way to completely down paying off that loan, let's spread it out and address some of the needs and concerns that we have across the state. And when I mentioned the nine hundred and ten million dollar ending balance, and it's true that's where we're sitting at right now. However, that's also factoring in we have the. The transfer that did not go to Kansas Department of Transportation mm. of 293 million baked into that. Okay. Um, and so we need to basically wean ourselves off of that because in the governor's budget, she did re reduce uh, the amount that was supposed to be transferred uh, by 55 million dollars. That would go to KDOT, but we'd still keep 238 million dollars in this in the state general fund. I see. And in one of the uh, committees that I served on during the interim while we were out of session was the Transportation Task Force, where we traveled all across the state oh, right. and right. Um, talked about different aspects and different components of transportation, and then also had local testimony on what projects they would like to have completed in their regions. And we had over 400 requests mm -hmm. with a, you know, the price tag in the billions, and there's just, right. we can't do every one of them, but there are things we need to address in regards to transportation. 
No, very good. Very good. Well, I add to that discussion. <clears throat> the governor, I mean, uh, the people spoke. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I, I think if you look, if you look at the big picture, yes, people want, and I think we've always wanted to get things done. Mm -hmm. But one thing I would s say to give a piece of advice to the governor's staff: know your audience. Know your audience. Before they were inaugurated, they would go speak in front of groups, and I was there. Mm -hmm. And <laughs> to try to, you know, to win friends and influence people, you don't basically tell you how wrong you were. I see. Uh, you, you, okay. you tell me what you're going to do to help solve the problems rather than how horrible the last administration was. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You can do that without almost saying those words verbatim. Sure. And that was that's the case. I mean, come on. That, <laughs> and so that was that was unfortunate. You know, it's one thing to say I want to get along as long as you agree with me, then that's getting along. But I, mm -hmm. so I don't think that's going to work. Um, I looked back two years ago on um, my column that I do during the session, and I wrote about the governor's budget, Governor Brownback's budget hitting with mm -hmm. a thud. I think this one did as well. Okay. Um, when they did the presentation, I don't think that uh, Budget Director Campbell was quite ready for the response that he received from legislators that uh, uh, really questioning some of the math, some of the things. I see. Uh, you know, I, I want to get along with them. I am, I, I am very, uh, I think agriculture will be pleased with Mike Beam being the new Secretary of Agriculture. That was one we didn't know for sure who was going to be the Secretary of Agriculture. I have met uh, the new uh, Department of, uh, K KDHE, Department of Health and Environment, the new uh, Transportation Secretary, of course, who served on the task force, and, mm -hmm. and a few others. And so you know, we're willing to give the benefit of the doubt, absolutely. But let's work for solutions. You're, you're absolutely right. Yeah. But I think some of the priorities that the governor have may be a little bit different than the legislature. And you also have to, I mean, we talk, talk about the politics. Yep. A lot, a lot <laughs> of people are running for the U.S. Senate, and so you have to kind of question maybe some motives of what is going on, and that's right. maybe not in our side of the, of the building, but the other side. Some so, of the some right. of the things that you know, <clears throat> kind of taking the pressure off the House side anyway, right now. <laughs> yes, understandable. Uh, once again, I remind, I want to like to remind folks that this is a call-in program. Uh, the number is one eight hundred three three seven. 4788, so please call in if you have any questions. I think the, um, the biggest thing to always keep in mind is that, <coughs> yes, this is the governor's budget, but it's just used as a baseline. Yeah, right. Um, we did the same thing with Governor Brownback, mm -hmm. uh, because uh, he's the only governor that I served under, uh, and Ken also. Mm -hmm. uh, but we just use that as a baseline. And then the budget committees, they're the ones that actually hold the hearings and uh, in their committee and talk with the agency heads and the departments and go through their recommendations and they go through the governor's recommendations and then ultimately then that budget committee comes in with their own recommendations right. and then uh, the, budget, uh, the budget chairs have to then report that to appropriations and then we make our uh, own recommendations and amendments uh, to whatever comes out of the budget committee. So it's going to be vastly different than what the, the sure. governor has uh, submitted. But the baselines sure. are good, like as higher education budget chair, um, you know, she is planning on trying to make the final, the restoration back from the cuts from before. So right. at least we kind of know what the baseline <coughs> somewhat to work on. Very important to Fort Hayes, very, you know, we have mm -hmm. only the, the four years, uh, the regent schools, but also the the technical schools right. and the community right. colleges and everybody's everybody struggling. Everybody's trying to find, you know, ways to stretch their dollars and 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 so we're gonna maybe look at some innovative things and looking at, you know, public private partnerships and looking at, you know, how how we're just gonna have to get away from the way we've done business in a sense in the past. Sure. Uh, you know, basically coming in with your hands out and saying, you know, give me, give me, give me. It's more, how can we work together? Mm -hmm. One of the things that I that I'm going to try to do over the next two years is help um, tear down that wall of education, basically K twelve and higher ed. It really all works mm -hmm. together. Okay. One can't blame the other. Well, we talk about so. educating Kansans. It right. starts at pre K through through college. And making sure that we, you know, we have a low unemployment rate right now. We have, you know, jobs that aren't being filled. Are we right. meeting those needs? And right. can every need be met by a four-year degree? 
Well, we're saying that's not the case. So never, how, it never has been. So well, yeah. right. But <laughs> yeah. but in the past, but 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 primarily, right. we have looked at somebody that has a certificate in a different level than maybe we should. Mm -hmm. But today, somebody with a certificate as a welder will make more money than somebody with a four-year business degree. Yeah. And that, that that's that's not to disparage either one, but it's sure. just it, it's a matter of of you know what do we want to do and so we want to make sure that those that those that provide right. a technical assistance or those to go those, those type programs are supported just as much mm -hmm. oh for sure I think that's well and one of the things that um, I kind of wanted to get more of a direction from the governor yesterday when I met with her is when she was in the election she said that she was going to set up an office of real prosperity mm -hmm. never really mm -hmm. uh, stated exactly what that was going to look like so that's why yesterday when I talked to her about the budget I did ask her about that as well and I said what is your direction as far as the rural prosperity because the Speaker of the House also took the initiative and set up a rural revitalization committee uh, that is uh, chaired by uh, Representative Don Heineman mm -hmm. and, uh, and so I just kind of wanted to see what, where she was gauging and what she was looking at and it's you know it's beyond um, economic development I mean that's right. going to be a focus but it's also going to be education, it's going to be health care, it's going to be roads, it's going to mm -hmm. encompass everything. Broadband is another um, avenue that uh, she would like to have incorporated with that. Um, so I, I'm, I'm eager to see exactly what comes out of that office, mm -hmm. which is being headed by the Lieutenant Governor Lynn Rogers. And I'm, I'm anxious to see what comes out of the Rural Revitalization Plan uh, Committee yeah, yeah. and see exactly what they're going to do to address the needs of, of rural Kansas. Um, because there's, there's there was a map that Don Heineman shared that shows a lot of the counties in western Kansas in the next 10 years is going to lose a substantial amount of their population. Right. I mean, like some of the counties that I represent, like Smith and Jewell on that map, he was saying possibly 40%. Mm -hmm. And so we need, to, we need to address the needs of rural Kansas and, and uh, try to implement something on that end. Right. Exactly right. Well, that's for sure. I. Uh Part of my research at the Institute is to track demographic trends, and that's definitely the case. Uh, well, I think some of my studies shows that in the next 50 years, we're going to have more people in the four larger cities in western Kansas than the entire western, the rest of the area. Well, and that was one thing that we talked about when we had Rough the Transportation speaking. Task Force meeting uh, in Olathe, is that they're projecting by 2030 that Johnson County will be almost twice the size it is now. And so and, and we were looking at that as far as hmm. transportation needs right. of what do we need to do to get ahead of that because right now we're already behind with 69 highway that runs uh, north and south in Johnson County and because there's a lot of uh, construction that needs to be done on that road but you have all this building that has come around it so how do we handle that right. Right. and so it was like how do we address the population growth there but then we also, also need to address the population loss, loss. Right. out in rural Kansas. Right. Yeah. Well, and I, and I think that's where, uh, like yesterday, with the workforce development was having uh, meetings in, in, in Topeka. I spoke uh, on the panel there, and, and we talked more about, you know, instead of saying, well, here's this one size fits all, it should fit anywhere, but really, we have to just do a better job engaging those that are here yeah. and encouraging folks either to come back or and you have to give them the tools they need and one of the things that it brought up we talked about the broadband task force mm -hmm. and broadband and things like that it's simply a matter of in today's world whether we like it or not and I still use a pencil but <laughs> it, and it, it's, it's <laughs> but you have to have high-speed internet yes yes and it's not just well some high-speed internet kids go off to some place like I live in the country I have DSL. I'm, I, I'm, I'm constantly working with my providers. How can I get it faster? Well, I don't have many people around me, so the cost is there. So, in fact, I talked to an electric uh, official last night, and I said, you know, we did, we did, uh, you know, the rural uh, telephone. We did rural electricity. Maybe we do rural broadband or trying some sort of technology. Mm -hmm. right. right. Because to me, it's more than just, oh, can I stream a video service? To me, it's a matter of safety of our rural of our of our yes, of yes. our rural areas outside of even a town of 200 people. Who's going to live in the country? Who? And, and, right. and, and we kind of laugh at that, but it's the truth. Mm -hmm. oh, you're right. And and uh, you know, there, there's 
it's there's it's a it's very noble to live but how many people still there's not that many people probably that draw their water from a cistern and have an outhouse i mean right. they they and i don't mean to be that simplistic but it's that's where we are to communicate you know i can remember when i was a little kid we said you know one of these days we're going to have tv satellite dishes that are this big around and we're going to be able to have something to where you can work around the world in rural Kansas. Yeah. And we're, we're so close, we're about 86% there, I think. I think we have a call. Uh, Bill from Pratt, do you have a question? Well, yes, yeah, sir. I, uh, I uh, am surprised uh, the amount of time that transpired between our uh, calls. But uh, I have a question regarding uh, uh, used gym, uh, high speed internet, the used gym pod you see outside. I got a call here a year and a so ago, and uh, I had uh, Dish Network, the high speed internet provider at the time, and uh, they sold me this uh, bill of goods with uh, used in Fox, limited data, unlimited calling inside the continental United States. I thought, here's a chance to get rid of my landline and my fax out of my house. I see. But I, uh, I'm on the end of a, a wired connection, CenturyLink. And uh, basically, we were shuttled around uh, through the Sprint uh, system when Clinton had his uh, rural telephone improvement package. So we weren't a small telephone company, so we fell in a hole. The rest of the county outside of some of us have, uh, have better Internet access. My point is, I bought this used Gen 5 high-speed Internet and was told I could disconnect from Dish Network and stream it. And when I uh, got the package all installed and running, it became obvious uh, the very first day Dish Network guy showed up to install it. It's owned by Dish Network, Charlie Ergen, the whole company, and they're running two separate side-by-side -side sister corporations building for access into your home. If you have one of the voice activated okay. Votes, you have to have the internet to control it. So, well, it does sound like we can. Uh, okay, I think I think we got the gist of your call. I think we'll. Uh, thanks, very much. Well, uh, here, here's the other question. I have okay, to, go ahead. Call. I heard you. I heard you talking about the internet. I thought I'd give you my experience, but here's the other yeah, thing. That's fine. Uh, I don't understand how the legislature keeps sweeping money out of the chip into the general fund at the end of every budget situation out of the oil field plugging money. We pay our monies in every year's operators to the state. At the end of the year, they may sweep up to a million dollars that was designated to be plugging money and goes right into the general fund. Don't you think there would be some financial accountability for this activity? Okay, thank you very much. We'll, we'll uh, discuss that. Thanks. Uh, we're going to go ahead and do the, the second question first. Yes, um, sounds good. Actually, that was brought up at the uh, Kansas Independent Oil and Gas Association annual meeting in Wichita. Uh, did you attend that meeting? Yep. And that was it was brought up, uh, okay. the, the state sweeping um, funds from the, the, um, the oil and depletion fund. Right, right. Uh, oil and gas depletion fund. Well, actually, I, we might want to probably provide a little background on that. So there's a there's an oil and gas depletion fund yes. that oil companies put money into. Or yes, okay. and uh, and that's it's, it's, it's supposed to be there to kind of offset mm -hmm. um, okay. if there is a, a lower production. Right. And when we were having budget issues uh, up until uh, about 2017, um, the, the state was looking at any fund. Uh, that we could, and if the funds weren't being utilized, I see. then they were being swept. Now, that could be up for discussion on how do you want to say if they were what being utilized, utilized yeah. because organizations that had those funds would say, well, we were holding it until something, you know, it needed to be addressed, and then when you sweep it and then something does happen, it's not there. Right. And But that happened to a, a, an array of uh, funds across the, the state of Kansas. And it was because we were trying to fill a deficit situation in a budget hole. Um, this year, uh, one of my objectives, and I'm going to have that with the committee, is that we stop doing those. 
mm -hmm. uh, especially if they're smaller amount ones. Leave that with the agencies that they were sp respectively supposed to stay with, um, because as I mentioned before, right now we are sitting at 900 plus million dollars ending balance, mm -hmm. um, and so we need to strategically realign the budget um, as much as we possibly can. And so that, that's one of the things um, that we are going to try to. But it do. does sound like the uh, the sweeping aspect of things hasn't always been that way. It's just dealing with the emergency. Oh, it's been going on for years. I, I, I mean, would, well, it, I mean, it, years as in last ten years, or years as in. I mean, every administration. It's, it's bipartisan. I mean, it's, yeah. it's, it's no, it's, I understand it is, that. It is. It's, just, I, it's been yeah. going for at least twenty years that I can recall. Yeah, and okay. So, what what it is is, is it, again, we'll. The state of Kansas isn't like the federal government. We, there's no printing press at the bottom right. of the state building. If, we, if we're running short, we can just... Plus, constitutionally, we have to balance Right, exactly. And so, right. so we didn't necessarily meet that threshold, but what was happening is, which was absolutely horrible, is any any money had, was, was swept in here, there, or whatever, so we didn't either have to bond more, borrow more at the end of bond to, to get through our situation. Right. Whether it be the oil field folks, <coughs> whether it be uh, those that pay sales tax, the money that went to, to, to roads and bridges. Mm -hmm. um, but it's also things like K through 12 education mm -hmm. and through some of the medical things that we have no control over. You know, it's just case loads, case, we have no the caseload as it goes up, right. we we pay, and uh, and, and that, that's that's just the way it is. And so, you know, a lot of time we, we talk a lot, we spend a lot of time every day in appropriations on a really a very small part of the overall budget. And so, I, and I and you know, I know um, uh, Chairman Waymaster has, has worked very hard in, in and already trying to crunch the numbers. So. We don't have to do those sweeps. I think in the governor's budget, right. she wanted to do uh, the highway fund sweep, what, for another three years or whatever, mm -hmm. even though we have a one year budget. So, still trying to figure out how all that, how on certain things we know maybe three or four years down the road, and others, right. you know, it, it's kind of that. Uh, yeah, I use the example of, you know, the old Popeye commercial, you know, Mr. Wimpy, you know, get, you know I'm, I'd gladly pay you next week for hamburger today. <laughs> and I think that's where we get into trouble. Sure, of course. Where where we want to we want to appease people right now, and then oh, somebody else will take care of it, and then all of a sudden now, we're 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 paying off our bonds, interest, you know, interest for years, and then when maybe we're gone from the legislature, that's when the real pain happens, and that that that's not right. right. And I think if we if you make an honest case to the Kansas people, they'll understand. Mm -hmm. And that, that's, that, that's, that's on all of us to make sure that it happens. And when you talk about sure. caseloads, like Ken mentioned it, and that's, that's the number we don't get until the April revenue estimate group, or the consensus revenue estimate group meets. Okay. And last year it was $100 million. And we had to pay it. Mm -hmm. I mean, there, there's no way around it. You have to pay that, that caseload estimate. And so this coming April, we just had the, the caseload estimate again in November. That's kind of projecting where we're going to be in 20 in the rest of fiscal year 2019 okay. and in 2020 but in April they're going to project it again and it could be another hundred million dollars that oh, we've got to pay mm -hmm. right. and so when we try to put the budget together we've got to keep that in mind too that when the consensus revenue estimate group meets and they come up with the caseload estimate we have to pay that item and so there may be some things that need to suffer now granted right now uh, we are sitting um, in, in a very good position, but as Ken mentioned, you know, we had to ba balance the budget during those rough years. Of course, right. And so we had to piecemeal things together. And that's one thing that the Appropriations Committee is going to be working on into realigning the budget so we're not doing some of the, as I say, uh, creative counting ma maneuvers we've done in the last couple years. Very good. Okay. We do have another call. Sandra from Phillipsburg. Go ahead, please. Yes. yes, go ahead, please. That's fantastic. Okay. Uh, I would like to know if they're going to expand the Medicaid and if they're going to get more money for our local hospital. I would like to hear them address that. Okay, thank you very much. Expanding Medicaid and one of the getting more proposals. rural into money into rural hospitals. That's sort of what we were talking about earlier. So. I mean, who was you? <laughs> well, I mean, I, I can start with it. Um, I don't think it's going to go anywhere in the committees. Um, hmm. Okay. Uh, because I think there was even a comment that I saw on Twitter this afternoon that uh, the chairperson of the Health and Human Services Committee 
uh, is not going, and I think it was referring to Medicaid expansion. Okay. Uh, the governor's uh, proposal for Medicaid expansion, and it's not going to have a hearing. Um, and that being said, uh, again, talking about the budget, I know everybody kind of talks about the federal dollars that will funnel back into the state of Kansas if mm -hmm. we expand Medicaid. Right. And the benefits that it will have for uh, not only our rural hospitals, but urban hospitals, and, that, and that's true. The money will come in. But there is a cost to the state. Mm -hmm. And when we're trying, even though, like I mentioned, even though we have an ending balance, if you project out what we're statutorily obligated to spend, which we change when we put the budget together, but mm -hmm. if you look at the statutes and what we need to spend, in 2021, we're already in a deficit situation. If we made all the obligations by statute that we have to, we are in a deficit situation. Mm -hmm. Now, of course, every year now, because we only have a year budget instead of a two-year budget, um, that is subject to change because every legislature can come in and make modifications to the budget. But uh, that's just basically saying if the revenues stay in where they're at, um, if there's no tax changes, if there's uh, no other revenue changes, we're in a deficit position in 2021. The issue with Medicaid expansion as far as a financial component mm -hmm. is what is the cost? What is that 10% that we, the state, would have to pay? And over the last few years, that has varied from its budget neutral to last year an amendment on the floor that said it was going to cost us $31 million a year to the Commonwealth Fund saying it could be up to $74 million a year because the states that have expanded Medicaid, the, basically the, the population that get on Medicaid has doubled. And then even the governor's proposal was $14.2 million for half a year. So if you just double that for a full year in 2020, that's $28.4 million. So what is the real number? We can never get an accurate number on what the state would be on the hook for. And with the financial insecurity that we have right now, mm -hmm. it's just something that we <clears throat> can't add. Mm -hmm. so, Sandra, I, I appreciate the call. I think we probably had this conversation before on the square in Phillipsburg. Um, it's not gonna happen this in Kansas right now. Um, I, as I tell folks, if you want to see what's going to happen in Kansas, look to the east. If Missouri, if Missouri does it, we'll probably enact it because some of the things we talked about mm -hmm. about population and, and the effect. Nebraska, uh, they just had uh, an initiative uh, that passed this November. Guess what? They have no idea how they're going to pay for it. That's what they're working on their legislature right now. Mm -hmm. uh, the people spoke. That's what. And, and I, I, I've seen the num I, I've seen the numbers of people that say they support it. But as I've talked to to folks in our rural areas and, and like the Phillips County Health Center, uh, the amount of money that that hospital would get is not gonna make sure the doors stay open. There are other ways. Critical access hospitals are reimbursed in a different form. Mm -hmm. Now, that being said, we all probably saw in the paper that you know Hillsboro is in trouble right. uh, with that hospital. Banks going to call the note or do some different things. Well, that's run by uh, a corporation that runs a lot of small rural hospitals. Uh, we saw the ones in Fort Scott, Independence. Well, that that, that was owned by a, a different company. That's not a, a county-owned critical access hospital. We're working with the federal delegation, with Dr. Marshall, who's the congressman in the first district, in trying to, to, to bolster uh, the, the reimbursements and, and the telemedicine and other things that are going back to our critical access hospitals. That That's key. Mm -hmm. And but, but as far as Medicaid expansion, Representative Waymaster is correct. Uh, until we have a, a good solid number, uh, uh, I, I mean, it, I, I don't. I mean, I, I, I am, I am one of, I think, two in Western Kansas that have voted against it. Mm -hmm. I, I'm still convinced that there's got to be other ways because of everything that comes along with it, and the costs get out of hand. Then, you know, we could talk about, we could talk about our other needs, our, our behavioral health situation. We had a story today about how morale is low in our correction facilities. I mean, go through the numbers. Hmm. I mean, how much more do you want to pay in taxes? <clears throat> and we're not, the soak the rich stuff, you might as well get over it, because that's not going to go anywhere either. Because <laughs> guess who's rich? Somebody that makes a dollar more than you. Because none of you, I mean, that's, that's really, and that's what we think. And I don't mean to be simplistic about it, but 
you know, it's it it's to think that, you know, if you make a certain amount of money, like we see on the national level, that we'll have some absorbent tax rate that's going to cure our ills, it's not going to be the case. So we, again, have to make solid, good financial situations and, take, and, and have honest conversations about health care in Kansas. I know a group of newspapers have came out this week and, 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 and making the case and, and doing those things. And absolutely, there are, there are probably uh, hospitals in Kansas that Medicaid expansion would very well for. But if you're wanting to save our critical access and rural hospitals, that I do not believe that is the answer. It is, again, is a short-term fix for a long time uh, because, again, I go back to if if the feds, you know, step out and all of a sudden we've, gonna mention that. we've got to do mm -hmm. everything. Right. That's why I've worked so hard and as a member of the tax committee now for the third year that we don't put counties in position where the county commissioners have to go and raise property taxes. I mean, right. that you, you talk about an issue. Anybody that owns land, farm or investors, they, they it, it has to stop. And we, we just, we, if we make those good, solid investments, it, it, it takes time. But in today's world, we have to have the, it's like a TV show. You know, if Law and Order, when it starts, by the end of the, you know, you got things solved in an hour. It doesn't quite work that way. <laughs> well, and then Ken is right. There's a lot of uh, us that are concerned about, it is a, it's an unfunded mandate because the state does have to put up part, a portion of it, 10% of it. And if the federal government ever would pull back on Medi Medicaid expansion, because let's look at the federal government and where our, our, our debt is at right now, mm -hmm. uh, nearing mm -hmm. $21 trillion. I mean, the spending in Washington, D.C., it's got to be reined in. And that's possibly one thing that, that could fall back onto the states, um, and they'd have to pick it up if the federal government would cut back uh, any of the uh, reimbursements back to the states. Um, and right now, if that would happen to the state of Kansas, uh, we would be in a, an extremely dire situation. Mm -hmm. um, because, like I said, we've got to address the uh, Supreme Court ruling on K-12 education and how we want to move forward with that. And that they'll already they'll absorbs 52% of the state budget. Okay. Well, and with no tax increase. But the governor yeah. came out and said, uh, you know, we're going to do all these things with no tax increase. And we said even election night, Governor-elect Kelly, we're with you. Now, Governor Kelly, we're with you. We'll work with you to make sure we don't raise taxes. So well, and actually, one of the components <laughs> that she also yeah. had was to reduce the sales tax on food which has been an initiative of some members of, of the House and the Senate. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, but at, right, at this moment, it, it's just impossible to even get that sort of a tax discussion started because of the cost and the loss of revenue coming into the state because, as I mentioned, at our current spending levels and our current revenue numbers, I mean, we will be in a deficit situation in 2021. And, mm -hmm. uh, and more so in 2022 and 2023. Right. It just it just cascades in the next following years. If if we don't change revenue, we're if we don't, if we well, we got we've got to structure the budget in a way that we're addressing the needs of the state for one, and two, that we're making sure that we're meeting our constitutional obligation that we're balancing the budget. Let's let's get let's shift into the education discussion then. Um, I know that you're on the higher education budget uh, committee, Ken. So uh, let's talk about the. That issue. <laughs> well, you know, with the cuts that were made a couple of years ago, the, the temp last year was, was was about half of that to restore. Mm -hmm. uh, hopefully, we can restore at least that much. What I've told folks is that the goal is to at least um, try to get there, rather than with any cuts. Um, you know, we're looking at, at tuition costs. Tuition costs keep going up. Um, you know, and just overall cost. So there's some other things we can do, or there's some innovative things uh, we can do. And so, um, you know, I, I don't, you know, the, you know, what some of the schools are coming at with, with what they want. I mean, I think they know that that's probably unrealistic right now. Mm -hmm. But we've also got to address this, the issue of of uh, enrollments are not exactly where they are. We have a couple places that are doing quite well, mm -hmm. but we also have to look at the the dynamics and the. Uh, 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 just as the the way our uh, uh, demographics are of the state of Kansas, we just don't have as many students maybe as we did. Right. And there's st in today's world, there's so many different options, uh, not only in Kansas but every place to go to school, to go to college, to get to, or, or tech mm -hmm. school or whatever. So um, those are some those are some of the things that we're we're working on. And again, I think to uh, put a focus on. Um, 
you know, the technical schools, the community colleges, and, and help that and, and to make sure uh, every school says they're working uh, to make it a smooth transition. We want to make sure that's that's the case and also mm -hmm. to continue to, that schools can offer, uh, colleges can offer uh, those classes in high school so that you know, maybe help uh, folks with lower the cost so maybe you can get a few mm -hmm. hours if you go into our region schools or our, right. or our, uh, or our state schools uh, and, and try to save some money and again and work with them to make sure that that they can get their their courses done in in four years for a bachelor's degree. I mean, that extra year is is quite a bit of money. That is, that is. Very good. Anything to add about education you haven't mentioned already? Well, and and I met with some of the uh, heads of the Regent schools. Uh, I think the only two that were not in that meeting were KU and K State. Um, the other four were hmm. in my office, and they were talking about the restoration that they would like to have back. Sure. Um, not from the cut that was made in 2016. Uh, but the one that was made in twenty uh, in twenty oh eight, yeah, right, and that that's a much larger item. It's about eighty million dollars um, that they were they're asking for. Sure, um, and I, I think in a big, nice I way, I told them that's pro that's not going to happen. <laughs> yeah, um, I, I give them credit for asking for it because that's what everybody else is doing. They see that ending balance, and they're like, oh, the state has money. Let's go and ask for mm -hmm. all these enhancements. Um, but we can try to spread that out and then address some of the needs. That we have. It's like I had a meeting uh, with KDADS, uh, and that we were talking about Osawatomi and Larned State Hospital. And one of the problems that they have is that the technology in those uh, two institutions don't interface with local hospitals. We're, we're hmm. using a, a the DOS program still okay. in Osawatomi and uh, in Larned. And so, how much is that going to cost to upgrade the system right. to where they can actually uh, be interchangeable? And if, if somebody has to go from Osawatomie to Olathe Medical, or from you know Larned State Hospital to the local hospital in Larned, right? Uh, the records don't follow right now because mm -hmm. they can't work together. But that cost to make a, to put in a system where it can is twenty five million dollars. Hmm. Now is that? a need that we probably need to address most likely so because I don't think it's it's, it's not basically uh, helping those state hospitals function right. and also it'd probably help us with uh, you know the certification which we had the issue with Oswatomi a couple right. of years ago okay. so there, there's an array of, of issues and topics that we've put on the back burner for so many years it's it's finally ruling its ugly head right. and we're gonna have to address some of those needs when we talk about that on appropriations. And I, I'm, uh, this is Ken's first year on appropriations. And you know, when we start putting the budget together and people have what they want to go in there and then somebody else has something they want in there, it, it, it does turn into an extremely uh, uh, heavy and emotional huh. uh, meeting. Huh. Uh, because there's time, I mean, I've had members start crying. I've had, I mean, it's just, it's a very emotional because their heart is in that program. Right. And then, but at this point, we just can't do it. And, and so Ken will experience that in, in late March. Get <laughs> my so. box of Kleenex ready to go, huh? Yeah, right and everybody was just wondering how I just sit there and just, I, just, <coughs> just, uh, I, take, I take everybody's comments, but we can't do everything. Of course. Right. right. Well, we're going to run out of time, but there's, there's so many, there's you know, a lot of things that have maybe garnered attention and aren't really going anywhere because we're, right now it's really still bill introduction time and just getting kind of into the heart of, gonna, of having our having the hearings and learning more about it but um, you know that's just been a bill introduced on sports wagering mm -hmm. I guess two bills one okay. to do it two that if it's done it's done at the racetrack facilities uh, that we, they tried to do uh, bring the dog and horse racing back so uh, you know it, we'll probably do something there along that line um, uh, sales tax, uh, the, the the Wayfair decision on internet sales tax, something will come there, probably. Okay. Uh, but again, neither one of those are great windfalls. Um, so, of course. Um, you know, it just depends. Well, and then we have the tax dis discussion on the Senate that well, passed in the Senate last year, failed in the uh, House, um, but that's with what they call the windfall money uh, from the uh, tax changes on the federal tax code. Um, as far as uh, itemized deductions and and giving that money back to the people of Kansas instead of the state holding on to it, and we've had some interesting uh, developments in the Senate where 
they've created a new special tax committee and uh, that's being chaired by the president of the Senate and, and moving forward uh, instead of the regular taxation committee. Uh, uh, so we have that, okay. that component coming into play as well. Understandable, yeah. In fact, I was going to ask, um, uh, you, I think you mentioned earlier this, this evening that 89 some odd bills have been Eight, eight, 84 somewhere. in the House, 47 in the Senate. So, so any key ones jump out at you that maybe be push, well, going through your committees or you mentioned a couple of uh, the sports betting and... Uh, we, we have yet to have one being routed there, there's really by the not. Speaker to appropriations. Right, okay. and, and ta tax will come. I mean, I think there's, we've had some minor, some ones that have dealt with county specific things, but okay. there'll, there'll be some more coming in. But th there's a lot in our, the Federal and State Affairs Committee will have tons. They've had a lot of alcohol bills and, right. and some, th a lot of those, uh, those type of bills will deal there. Uh, the Senate, there's a couple, I see one that um, mm -hmm. uh, wants to move the school board elections from uh, the summer, whatever, then back to January, because that's when they do their, their, their you know, shifting around of, of reorganization, reorganization right. of their school the boards. And so it makes November sense because a lot of folks, yeah. you know, they get elected, they have to wait, and all of a sudden you're in basically the middle of the school year, and all of a sudden now you have, you can have a whole new president, and that could mean different things. And so huh. just trying to do some cleanup things. I know there's, they're, they're going to hmm. do a lot of work in the elections committee on trying to maybe clean up some of the issues we had this fall with different things. And so it's, the, uh, there'll be there'll be some committees that have a, they'll have a lot of things and okay. and really the committees that we'll just kind of wait and, and as it comes and then towards the end it'll be uh, it'll be a lot of work <laughs> being done. Yeah. Any any uh, other interesting uh, maybe not bills going through your committees but that you're uh, that are interested in seeing uh, pursued? You mentioned sports betting is one that's sort of bubbles up. I think so. Because, again, the Supreme Court, the, the, the sports betting one, I, I don't know how it's going to play in western Kansas. If we'll have maybe some of our, of our, of our bigger communities, I don't see every town having one. Uh, I, I think... Uh, it'll be it'll be interesting but, how... I don't to interrupt, but okay. it'll be interesting how the casinos address that because they're going to look at it as expanded gaming. Right, well... And they're going to want it in their casinos. Right. And if you have a bill that just has it in the racetracks, uh, it, Chairman Barker is going to have his hands full working sure. with the right. racetrack owner and uh, the four casinos across the state of Kansas because it, we tried to put a bill together a couple years ago we were between the casinos and the racetracks on trying to get them open again um, because really the racetracks could be open now it's just they don't like the tax to pay on slot machines but uh, I see. that'll be interesting how that all oh, we do uh, plays together. Okay. All right, Bill from Oakley. Go ahead with your question, please. Uh, yeah, I was just wondering about uh, Columbus Day being to another Indigenous People's Day or something. Oh, the change of Columbus Day? Yeah. I think oh, is that what he said? I couldn't Yeah, I think okay. that's what right. it was. Uh, it's been introduced oh. before. Okay. You know, it, you know, Columbus Day to Indigenous People Day. Uh, I, I don't know if it's going to go anywhere. And I, it's, like I say, it's been it's been introduced at least once or twice, I think, and and uh, it may have a hearing, but I don't know if it'll he'd make it out of committee. That uh, would be my guess. Yeah, okay. I, I, I don't know. That's going to go through federal and state affairs, right? Um, and, and it may be. I, I can't say for the discretion of the chairman, but he may have a hearing. He may not. I don't know. And so I just don't know exactly what's going to be uh, uh, how that bill is hmm. going to be progressing. Right. Well, and, and and that right now, I think that's one of the things that, that you're saying is is uh, good or bad. I think some of the things you're seeing in Washington are working its way down into state legislators, and Kansas is no exception. Sure. To we're trying to do, in a sense, model legislation for different. And what I mean by that, I don't mean you know those groups that have. Well, here's a you drop this in <laughs> and said some some evil thing. It's just. Okay, we do this, and, and other states have done this. So let's right. do this, and right. mm -hmm. and uh, which which are, I guess are all fine, well, and good. But yeah. but you know, let's uh, we again. There's a lot of heavy lifting, mm -hmm. and but you know, the first part, first of the session, you do uh, you do some of these bills, and and uh, and see what happens. Daylight savings time, right? That was introduced again. I I, I, I don't think that's going to go anywhere either. I mean, it. That, but it, you know what it does it creates. I guess if you want to get your name in the paper or on TV, generate br headlines. You know, bring that up, and then people, everybody has an opinion on it. So that's true. Um, that's true. So that's the thing. Okay, we got it. Thanks. We have about two minutes left in the show. So if anybody has some quick questions they would like to call in with, one eight hundred three three seven forty seven eighty eight. 
If not, let's the alcohol bill you mentioned uh, briefly here. Was that a carryover from last year? And if so, what was the issue there? The alcohol bill? Uh, oh, there, I'm not sure. There, there are oh, some. okay, okay. I, I think it has, to do, it has to do with the heavy beer, I think. It's oh, the, right, right, yeah. right. It, right. It's, it, it's some stuff it's that has to be done and, and so on. So I'm not ex sure exactly what it is. Right. The, just briefly on the um, the uh, the Internet sales tax, yes. uh, it's, it, 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 probably what a lot of states are doing or following the model, the South Dakota model, like if you have at least what ten thousand or hundred thousand dollars worth of sales, uh, then it would be collecting or a number of transactions. Most people are are not worrying about that, but just the the, the dollar the amount for it's collected. Right. And right now we're already we're we're, we're capturing the revenue from Amazon, Best Buy, and Walmart, the yes. top three right. uh, the people right. are buying from, and so. It could bring anywhere from okay. eight, twelve. Yeah, really, the amount of money that it can bring in is going to be extremely minimal when you because look at the revenue side. Picking up from right. the big yeah. sites. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I mean, it's yeah. I guess we talked in the session. We'll see how we'll see if we progress to yeah. on anything. Okay, very good. Well, we have a less than one minute left. Anything else you want to bring up while we're here today? Or? No, it's just it's been. I mean, the usual case at the beginning of session been kind of slow. Uh, we have a lot of bill introductions. Uh, Next week, uh, we should be, not this next week, but the week after next, okay. in appropriations. That's when uh, the budget chairs will actually get the budgets broken out for their respective committees. And they'll be working on uh, those budgets and then bringing them back to appropriations. And then we'll start putting everything back together. Uh, but it, we're just kind of in the normal uh, cause of the process right now. Okay. Oh, got to wrap it up. I would say go to the Kansas Legislator website. Find the numbers, contact your legislator, instead of, yes, you know, we do. can tell you directly what's going on. All right. Well, thank you very much for uh, watching the show tonight. This has been Mike Walker with the Docking Institute before a state. <laughs>